Welcome to Steinman Park. And thank you today for joining us in celebrating LNP's 225th birthday. I'd like to begin today by introducing our hosts, members of the Steinman family. First, members of the James Hale Steinman branch of the family. His daughter, the family's matriarch, and chair emeritus of Steinman Communications, and co-chair emeritus of the Steinman Foundation, Miss Peggy Steinman. His granddaughters, who serve as directors of both Steinman Communications and the Steinman Foundation, Carrie Hill and Hale Krasny. And his great-grandson, Tom Hill. The John Frederick Steinman family is represented by his granddaughter, co-chair of the Steinman Foundation, Pamela Tia. I want to acknowledge all of our elected officials who are here today, along with the many business and educational leaders from our community who are among us. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the employees of LNP and Steinman Communications, and those of you who have supported and continue to support one of the longest running, locally owned news organizations in the country. LNP Media Group strives to provide the most relevant and comprehensive coverage of news for Lancaster County. Much of what our county, township, municipal, and borough governments uh, in Lancaster, what they do is affected by activities of state government in Harrisburg. Because of its outsized influence on our county, I'm pleased and honored that our state's chief executive is with us to celebrate our birthday. Cornelia Wolf, the governor's mother, was a native of Columbia Borough here in Lancaster County. Although she was wooed away and across the Susquehanna by Bill Wolf, uh, her son's allegiance to and affinity for uh, her mother's, his mother's home county remains strong today. So it is my high honor and distinct privilege to introduce the governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, my friend Tom Wolf. Thank you, Bob. I can't tell you how pleased my mother would be uh, if she had heard you acknowledge that Columbia Borough is actually in Lancaster County. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really a nice thing. Uh, and, and she, she was uh, very proud of her Lancaster roots. Uh, and it was never clear in my family who was civilizing who, the York Countyans or the Lancastrians. So, but I am really pleased to be here to help celebrate and acknowledge the 225th anniversary of LNP. Uh, this is really a phenomenal institution, not just in Lancaster and Lancaster County, but in the whole state. Uh, and I think that's really something that we, and I want to acknowledge. And I think just to put it in perspective, 1794, uh, as a history buff, it's, it's important, I think, to recognize that just then, Lancaster was still a borough and would be another 22 years. Where's the mayor? Yeah. Be another 22 years after 1794, actually 50 years, sorry, uh, or 22 years before uh, Lancaster become a city. George Washington was president of the United States. Uh, the Bill of Rights had been ratified only three years earlier, and the author of the First Amendment, First Amendment, 
James Madison would live another 42 years after 1794, uh, and uh, it was Madison. Uh, and I think if he were here today, he would be very proud of the work that the journalists and all of the family has done to maintain LNP uh, and that proud tradition that started in 1794. As he said, the freedom of the press as one of the great bulwarks of liberty shall be inviolable. That is the draft of Madison's resolution that became the First Amendment. In the centuries since he penned these words, LNP and its subsidiaries have covered fires and crashes, deaths and births, corruption, celebrations, groundbreakings and closures, and with every printed word, the citizens of Lancaster became a little bit better informed about the world that surrounded them. There's no doubt in my mind that one of the primary reasons Lancaster has steadfastly thrived as a city, as a community, is the strength of the local press and the things that LNP has done for that city and that community. Now, I've been in public life for four years now. Before that, I was in, private sec in the private sector. So I can attest that sometimes it is a little difficult when the newspapers shine a spotlight on you. It's uncomfortable, but it's necessary to be faced with a perspective or a truth that is not necessarily yours. Some leaders like Benjamin Franklin and Abraham Lincoln dealt with this by printing their own news. Others like Franklin Delano Roosevelt and others that we might name today openly complained about what they considered an unfair press. And some like John Adams attempted to enact laws that would actually shut the press down. We're fortunate. We are all fortunate that the Americans who have come before us, for the most part, understood and upheld the words of the First Amendment, that we must recognize that it is our sacred duty to continue to protect the inalienable right to free speech. We need you at LNP to continue to play your part, shining your light in the darkest corners of our world, to expose corruption, to highlight greatness for all the years ahead. So congratulations again on 225 great years. Here's to 225 more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor Wolf. Your sentiments are very kind, and we will do our level best to live up to uh, the standards you articulated. The International News Media Association, also known as INMA, is the world's leading provider of global best practices for news media companies. It has roughly 10,000 members spanning 70 countries around the globe. We are a member of INMA because LNP Media Group is striving to bring global best practices to what we do. Earl Wilkinson is the globe-trotting executive director and CEO of INMA. His views on where news media companies fit into the emerging landscape are highly valued, and he is an inveterate trend spotter. LNP Media Group is thrilled that Earl was with us today to help us celebrate our birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, INMA's Executive Director and CEO, my friend Earl Wilkinson. I'm very much looking forward to this address. Uh, as Bob knows, I, uh, I do speak with media companies around the world. Um, I usually have fancy PowerPoint slides, and uh, I was just accused uh, of speaking at a conference in Eastern Europe last week of being an American-style TV evangelist. <clears throat> I'm not sure that was a compliment. <clears throat> uh, but on this august occasion, I'm going to stick to a script, which is fairly rare for me. Um, I told the governor... Uh, the only thing I have to do with politics in my youth, uh, I worked for a Democratic congressman and a Republican congressman, which would suggest to you I have very few morals. <clears throat> At least I'm agnostic. 
What I'd like to do today, though, is merge together this 225th uh, anniversary with some serious uh, themes that I think are facing media, just so we can literally bring you inside the tent of what is happening with news organizations around the world. But I'm going to do it in a non-traditional way. I'm going to start with a story that is absolutely true. When I was 14 years old, uh, I was selected by my high school journalism teacher um, to help the local newspaper in Tyler, Texas, take down scores, take down statistics, take down quotes from coaches on Friday nights during high school football season. Nothing's more important in East Texas. And after 10 o'clock each Friday night, coaches would call in the scores. And I was one of many kids who wrote down the information on a piece of paper, walked it to the other side of the sports department, and put it in a basket. And someone older, better, smarter, faster than me would write up the story, get the glory, and get the byline. Let's face it, I was just happy to be there. I was in awe to be in the same room with the men and women behind these bylines. By the end of the football season, the editor told me that I could write some stories, that I could see my name in print for the first time. And I got to tell you, folks, this is at the age of 14. This was magical. Nothing made my mother prouder than for her to brag to her friends about her son, the newspaper writer. Now, with 39 years of hindsight, it never occurred to me that the task assigned to me was so unimportant that they'd give it to a 14-year-old kid. Now, how unimportant? Folks, today there literally is software that can take those same scores, statistics, and quotes, and with one tap of a button, in a nanosecond, produce a perfectly good article. Better than a 14-year-old, better than a 53-year-old. This story illustrates the changes of news publishing today. Technology is destroying things that had value yesterday. It's happening in newsrooms. It's happening in advertising departments. It's happening in accounting departments, all departments. It's happening in your companies today. What I want to do today is share with you some insights on this great battle to recreate the value to the communities we serve, even as the great climate change of digitization forces us to question all assumptions. In a nutshell, the question is, how can we turn technology to our advantage? I've spent the last 30 days on the road. I'm a little jet lagged. I came in from Europe on Saturday. Uh, I actually spent the weekend uh, touring uh, a number of the museums in Philadelphia. In fact, yesterday I toured the Constitution Center and the American Revolution Museum. And I can think of no better institutions to remind us of the need to protect and enhance the things that our founding fathers set out to enshrine. When the First Amendment was integrated into the Constitution, we set forth as a country to define the ecosystem in which we, the people, would conduct the important business of constantly improving on the American experiment. More than two centuries later, we know that while the words on paper of the First Amendment guarantee a free press on paper, the practicalities of those words rely on at least three things to be constantly happening. Number one, there needs to be constitutional and systemic support from our country's leaders of the First Amendment. Secondly, there needs to be a robust connection between those who create journalism and the funding of those who create journalism. That's become disconnected. And thirdly, there has to be an inherent trust between publishers, and the markets they serve. Until recent times, all three of these practicalities have been part of the American fabric. Until recent times, all three have risen as factors supporting democracies around the world. 
They were just givens in any first world society. Yet something has changed. Something has snapped. Three years ago, a few days before the US presidential election, I was on a national conference call of retirement age influencers, a favor to a friend. I thought the subject was media business models, but all they wanted to talk about a week or so before the presidential election was trust. Why, I was asked, is the Chicago Tribune so biased and opinionated in its news coverage in a way they weren't 20 years ago? Two callers agreed they were biased, with one calling them too liberal, the other calling them too conservative. I suppose it's human nature to see what we want to see and hear what we want to hear. This reminds me of a board member upon review of my association's finances who asked a tart question, who audits the auditors? That was a lot of laughter down here in the front row. I got to tell you that right now. The, skepti the skepticism of motive did not begin in the last three years, yet no doubt it has grown worse. Another caller wanted to know where she can go for 100% unbiased news. Another caller wanted to know what actions to look for in a news brand to make it trustworthy or more trustworthy than others. Has media really changed? Or have consumer perceptions of media changed? Through research and success behind growing digital subscriptions, publishers have learned in the last few years that no great, greater indicator exists that a person will subscribe than if that person trusts the brand. That is a battle won long before the first word is ever read. It's a battle of perceptions, and we as an industry must do better in repairing the trust gap that helps bolster our constitutional protections. The visit to Philadelphia reminded me that the choice by a society to guarantee a free press and free speech is a brave one. Internationally, it's not universal. The choice suggests that questions must constantly be asked of those who govern. It is often an adversarial relationship from which better decisions and better outcomes flow. It's a system designed for a thick skin. I represent a global association of news organizations in 70 countries. Folks, the United States is hardly the only country affected by the digitization of media. And with that has come the lowering of barriers to publishing, the stirring of populism and nationalism by newly empowered groups, and yes, a decline in trust among institutions. And we all know that a disproportionate share of advertising dollars has shifted from media to Google to Facebook, uh, to Facebook and others, helping to accelerate a movement toward a reader's first business model for publishers. There are more people reading news today than at any moment in human history, thanks to the digitization of media, thanks to these powerful platforms that have democratized access to news and information. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that this perfect storm of trends has created a toxic and dirty ecosystem. One that threatens the relationship between the government and the governed. That threatens the ability of publishers to fund the distribution of news and information. And one that threatens our ability as citizens to discern fact from fiction and to create a scalable circle of trust. Now, maybe some of that has to do with bad actors on the international stage, and maybe that has to do with cynics on the domestic stage. Maybe some of that involves the unintended consequences of platforms that were slow to see their responsibilities beyond the algorithm. Yet I was at an international conference in Bulgaria on Friday that showed off the pending virtues of virtual newscasters and the rising need for news organizations to create security layers to detect smartly manipulated deep fake videos. Folks, this stuff is coming. One technology might save money, 
the other need will soon create a need to spend more money. It was a good reminder and a sobering reminder for me that the economics of publishing is changing. When LNP Media Group first began publishing 225 years ago, newspapers were at best political organs that broke even financially. They were targeted to the wealthy and the influential, the political and the merchant classes. By the 1830s, the rise of the penny press in our country brought on mass circulation of low-priced newspapers for the first time, extending news and information to the middle class and the working class. And with that bigger audience came advertising and a funding mechanism that supported the flourishing of journalism for the next century and a half. The rise of advertising, at least in print newspapers, stopped about 15 years ago. It's been a painful retrenchment. It's forced us to rethink and to reinvent. We have learned that two centuries of print newspapers give us little guidance about the decade ahead. Internationally, publishers are rapidly retooling their companies to serve readers who will consume journalism in digital forms ranging from the mobile phone to the tablet to the computer to platforms we can barely understand today. And as a result, a lot of these publishers are becoming data and digital specialists. They're borrowing from Netflix and Spotify and asking people to pay a subscription for digital content that we've spent the past two decades giving away. Publishers are diversifying how they support journalism. Most are trying to establish a direct relationship with readers. Some continue to reinvent an advertising business model online. Yet I know a company, a media company in New Zealand that now is selling fiber optic into households. I know another selling video on demand services. I can tell you of news companies that are evolving into advertising and marketing agencies under themselves. I can tell you others that are questioning their ownership models. Let's face it, folks, this is not your father's newspaper. Community publishers are charting different courses. Yes, there's an, uh, a, a trend toward consolidation of ownership to create scale, but there also are publishers trying to do what I believe LNP Media Group is doing to deepen community uh, roots and to double down on their entrenchment. Why does any of this matter? The great danger to the United States of America is not whether this company or that company, this family or that family owns this publication or that website. The great danger is to the communities that we serve that together constitute a well-informed national citizenry. The great danger to the emergence of news deserts is to the country itself and the principles on which it was founded. You're going to hear that term more and more, news desert. Sometimes a news desert is about the absence of a news organization in a community, which has begun to happen in the United States. Sometimes a news desert is about an emaciated news organization just starved of funding. Can we credibly say that we the people can exercise our will without access to facts, without access to news, without access to institutions that constantly hold truth to power? Doesn't that put too much trust in the hands of government and the powerful? Now, I'm going to reference my phone. I was just in Bob's office a few uh, minutes ago, and over his uh, desk was a frame that simply said, question authority. We do. I thought that was very powerful. I believe newspapers are community engines, big and small. Make no mistake, LNP Media Group is experiencing the impact of technological change and digitization. And while we celebrate their longevity and their past today, know that they are actively working on their future. This is an intellectually curious company that looks elsewhere in this country, elsewhere in this world, and even elsewhere into other industries to survive and thrive in this new environment. This is a company that's won international awards, national awards, through my association and others. 
Yet I can tell you this, nothing distinguishes LNP Media Group more than your love for Lancaster County. You are creative, you are entrepreneurial, you want to reflect your company's values. It is a great, great privilege to be here today to celebrate your 225th anniversary. I know that you will be at the heart of this community for many years to come and no doubt be a part of the reinvention of local media and its role in this great democracy. Thank you very much. To create something great every day, you have to be passionate about your work and focused on every detail. It's more than a goal. In our business, it's a requirement. It's a commitment that begins with you, our audience. Every day, you inspire us to inform you with the most comprehensive local news and information focused exclusively on Lancaster County. Thorough, accurate, timely, objective. They define our professionalism and our commitment to you. Every day you inspire us to entertain you and make you smile. We tell you about the diverse people and wonderful communities that make Lancaster County a special place. Every day you inspire us to serve you with a great experience. Whether you access us through digital or print media, or you simply talk with one of our employees, expect it to be an easy, convenient, and helpful experience. Expect us to provide value, value that makes your life easier, value that saves you time and money. Every day, you inspire us to engage you and the community. You are important to us. Lancaster County is important to us. We are locally owned, and this is our home. You can count on us to listen, to be involved. You can count on us to make a difference. For each of our advertisers, your success means everything to us. We promise to earn your trust, be a valuable marketing partner, and do whatever it takes to help your business thrive. You are Lancaster. You challenge us. You move us to be better every day. Thank you, Earl, for your very insightful remarks about the state of the news media industry around the world today. Your presence is very much appreciated, and your insights are uh, tremendously powerful, so thank you. We are here today to celebrate the 225th anniversary of the first newspaper that was printed by the organization that has become LNP Media Group. Much has taken place on the spot where we are assembled today. Some of you may remember getting bread at the Federal Bake Shop, which was previously located right here. Others may remember when Art Morris, then Lancaster City's mayor, greeted Catherine Graham, the legendary publisher of the Washington Post, when she spoke at the dedication of this Steinman Park four decades ago. But today we assemble to celebrate LNP's 225th birthday and its place in the community we all love. I want to thank each of you for all you have done to make this day and to make LNP possible. Initially printed 225 years ago, above a tavern located but a few dozen feet around the corner from here, the Lancaster Journal was one of a number of papers published in Lancaster at that time. One paper, supported by Benjamin Franklin, met the fate of others because it was not financially sustainable a result of challenges not dissimilar from those facing newspapers today. The governor gave, because of his, he is a student of history and I am <clears throat> not a student of much of anything, uh, gave you a sense of uh, Lancaster in 1794, but let me repeat what he said. Uh, it had a population of about 4,000. The entire county's population was about 36,000. George Washington was president of the United States and the Constitution was but about five years old. 
John Elkan is the scion of Italy's Agnelli dynasty, the chairman of a series of companies, including the controlling owner of CNH Industrial, which has a significant presence just up the road in New Holland. He understands the challenge of keeping alive his family dynasty and describes it as all about defying the odds. He said, if you look at companies that have lasted for more than 100 years, it's about 45 companies in a million. If you look at companies that have lasted 200 years, it's one company of about one billion. Today, we are celebrating our 225th birthday. We are one in a billion. First, a nod to our past. Your history is our history, the history of Lancaster County. In the past 225 years, our organization has printed approximately 85,000 separate newspapers. Most of them have been stored in the basement at 8 West King since they were printed. For these many years, as the governor no noted, Lancaster Countyans have shared every major milestone with their hometown newspaper the birth of children, honor rolls, dean's lists, graduations, military enlistments, promotions, engagements, weddings, anniversaries, the birth of children and grandchildren, and finally, the loss of loved ones. The cycle of life, the celebration in the morning, has been chronicled and shared with our community on the pages of this newspaper for the past 225 years. To give the community a broader sense of our past 225 years, we've partnered with Lancaster History to create an exhibit that tells our story. It opens on Wednesday. Go see it. It's at Lancaster History's brilliant facility on President Avenue. For the sake of full transparency, our collection of newspapers in our basement dates back only 224 years. It seems that the first edition of the journal, for which only 500 copies were printed, has been lost to the winds of time. To make the collection we have available to the public and preserve our record of the history of Lancaster County, LNP, in partnership with newspapers.com, is digitizing our entire 224-year collection of newspapers. <laughs> These archives will be searchable. This is our gift to the community our organization has sought to serve these many years. Beginning in 1951, the Steinman brothers, James Hale and John Frederick, began the practice of contributing a portion of the profits from their newspaper operation into local foundations to benefit the community. Today, the combined Steinman Foundation is one of the largest private foundations in the county. Over the past 68 years, it has given nearly $100 million to support community endeavors and, in conjunction with LNP, has created a unique ecosystem in the county. Here are but a few examples of the impact the Steinman Foundation has had here in Lancaster. Back when radiation therapy for cancer patients was in its nascent stages, the James Hale Steinman Foundation funded Lancaster General Hospital's acquisition of its first linear accelerator. It was only the sixth such machine to come online in the United States at that time. Subsequently, the foundation helped LGH purchase its second accelerator. And today, the Ann B. Barshinger Cancer Institute is recognized nationally for top performance in both quality of care and patient satisfaction. The Steinman Foundation was the lead funder of the Center for Regional Analysis, which will enable the county to understand itself through economic analysis and the collection and interpretation of data. The best example of the overall ecosystem created by the Steinman Foundation and LNP involves the Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology. Stevens recently dedicated its $24 million advanced manufacturing facility, the Griner Campus. At the dedication, 
Frank Greiner explained how he learned about the opportunity to purchase the land adjacent to Stevens. He was reading the local newspaper over breakfast. He discussed what he read in LNP about the land with his wife, Sharon. Frank then called Bill Griscom, the president of the school, and the rest, as they say, is history. But wait, there's more. Bill then approached the Steinman Foundation about contributing to the effort, and the foundation became a major donor to the project. The Steinman Foundation's president, Shane Zimmerman, and his foundation leadership team have also placed the foundation at the forefront of county workforce development initiatives. Its creation of the Lancaster County STEM Alliance and its introduction of UC Irvine's nationally recognized diversity, inclusion, and racial healing ambassador program are fostering our county's workforce of tomorrow. As Earl well chronicled, the challenges of publishing a daily newspaper are many, but they pale in comparison to the critical role newspapers play. Newspapers provide the connective tissue for communities. We create a common understanding of the facts to enable citizens to work together. As Pennsylvanians know, we have a great love affair with local government. We serve as its watchdog. In the past year, we have filed more than 100 right to know requests as part of our effort to better understand the way our government functions. When necessary, we initiate litigation to gain access to the public's records. If we did not do this, who in our community would fill this role as watchdog? It's local journalists who are pursuing these records. These journalists are your friends and neighbors, people you see in the local grocery store or in church. Their children go to school with your children. And they engage in journalism because they know their work will help the public be better informed. We began to monitor the use of our precious tax dollars in Harrisburg when we created The Caucus, a watchdog publication that focuses on activities in our state capital. We also partner with others to produce meaningful journalism. An example is our founding work with the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette to create a new Pennsylvania watchdog, Spotlight PA. Studies have shown that the cost of government increases when newspapers disappear. Studies also show that towns have less civic engagement when local newspapers close. Newspapers also provide a way for local businesses to reach their target audiences so that their businesses can grow and prosper. Many have suggested that in the digital age, we in newspaper business are passe. In some communities, that may be so, but not in Lancaster County. LNP Media Group, which includes Lancaster Online, Lancaster Farming, and our other weekly publications, has a very different business model than Facebook, Google, and other digital platforms. Our relationship with our subscribers and readers could not be more different. We charge for our journalism because we provide meaningful and unique local content. By contrast, Facebook is free. However, the reader must do the work to determine what is factual and what is not. They must also determine whether the content was created by journalists, friends, satirists, or the Russian intelligence agency. Facebook readers get what they pay for. By contrast, our journalists adhere to strict rules of journalistic ethics. We also verify every one of the more than 4,300 letters to the editor we receive annually. Imagine if Facebook did these things. As Earl noted earlier, the financial challenge today for newspapers is the loss of advertising revenue. Today, advertisers are moving to digital media, notwithstanding empirical data 
showing that print is the most effective way to imprint messages on audiences. The behemoths, Facebook and Google, scarf up the vast majority of all digital advertising revenue. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that they suck up, well, that was their phrase, uh, they could use some more editors, 77% uh, of our local digital advertising dollars. Facebook and Google have pledged with great fanfare to support local journalism. But please know that none of that support has reached Lancaster County. A recent Pew Research Center survey shows that most Americans think that local news is doing just fine. Only 24% understand that local news is struggling financially, and just 14% pay for any local news. This challenge has been too much for many newspapers, and as a result, today, 64%, or nearly two-thirds of the counties in America do not have a local daily newspaper. Two-thirds of the counties in America. In Pennsylvania alone, our state capital does not have a daily printed newspaper, nor does Pittsburgh. A number of families with long ties to the newspaper industry have left the business, including the Meade family in Erie, the Northrop family in Washington, the Calkins family and their award-winning publications in Bucks and Beaver counties and others are offering their newspapers for sale. The Barbie family has seen the Reading Eagle succumb to bankruptcy. Please know that LNP has not escaped the challenges facing our industry. Its revenues have dropped and its expenses have risen, but the path we are taking is different. While others emphasize digital first, or cash flow for their shareholders first, LNP Lancaster Online puts its readers first. This focus shows when LNP is compared to its peers. Another approach has been taken by newspapers like the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Tampa Bay Times. They are now owned by nonprofit corporations, even though they themselves are not nonprofits. A subtle modification to that approach was announced last month when the Huntsman family owners of the Salt Lake City Tribune filed with the IRS to convert their newspaper to a nonprofit corporation so that they would thereby be able to accept revenue from subscribers, advertisers, and donors. In order to survive as a meaningful news organization, we must continue to focus on creating and providing robust, meaningful, unique journalism for the communities we serve. We must continue to be the fair and decent watchdog of government that our founding fathers envisioned when they drafted the First Amendment to our Constitution. We've taken measures to ensure that LNP is on sound financial foot footing. First, we dealt with long lingering liabilities. Reporters from LNP and the caucus have written about the underfunded liabilities in state and local government pension plans. LNP had a similar challenge, facing a $50 million unfunded pension liability. Earlier this year, LNP's parent, Steinman Communication, terminated its long-frozen plan and shared more than $130 million in retirement benefits with former and current employees. Few news organizations today are able to take this step. And by contrast, our counterparts in Reading saw their retirement benefits take a significant haircut by virtue of the Reading Eagles bankruptcy. Shareholders look for returns on their investments. Today, the owners of LNP will no longer look to LNP for any return on its investment. Instead, they've committed that all of LNP's profits will be reinvested in LNP to prolong its future viability. The Steinman family is not 
presently seeking to convert LNP Media Group to a 501c3, as the Huntsman family is, nor is it contributing it to a foundation like the Lenfest Institute Philadelphia Inquirer model. The Steinman family will, however, forego all future dividends or distributions from LNP so that those dollars can be reinvested in LNP's future. To do this, the Steinman family has diversified beyond its historic media holdings. The Steinman family is also seeking to ensure that LNP can continue to produce its award-winning publications. To do so, we need to control our own destiny with our own workforce. As you all may know, our daily printed newspaper has the second largest core circulation in the state. We plan to continue to print LNP, as well as Lancaster Farming and our other newspapers for the foreseeable future. <laughs> Toward that end, LNP Media Group's wholly owned subsidiary, Susquehanna Printing Company, has purchased press and mailroom equipment that will enable it to produce all of our publications. Thanks to our partnership with EAE Systems of Germany, we will have state-of-the-art press controls, making our printing operation as efficient as any in the world. We are bringing back to Lancaster County printing and packaging of LNP. We will be doing this in a modern facility in Greenfield Corporate Center in East Lampeter Township. Led by Caroline Moraro, LNP is constantly evaluating all aspects of our operation to ensure that we operate as efficiently and productively as possible. Today, our offices are located at the site of the bar over which the first Lancaster Journal was printed 20, 225 years ago. The Steinman brothers purchased and rebuilt the building in 1927. It was subsequently renovated in the 1980s. At roughly the same time, our production building, which is located behind me facing Vine Street, was built to house our now shuttered printing and packaging operation. Both facilities today house the vast majority of LNP's employees. Both facilities are in desperate need of an update. We carefully considered renovating these buildings to restore them to their former glory. These buildings are linchpins for downtown Lancaster due to their location and their history, and any redevelopment or renovation must consider the past as well as their future. The Steinman family ultimately concluded that greater expertise would be required to bring the buildings into the 21st century within the fabric of downtown. The new owner preferably would be a family-owned firm that would be in it for the long term, not a financial investor looking to make a quick buck. They would ideally have significant experience with adaptive reuse projects and the financial wherewithal to complete the project. Finally, they would have a familiarity with and a relationship to Lancaster City so that they would understand the historic nature of these buildings and how they fit into the greater tapestry of downtown Lancaster. As a result, I'm pleased to announce that LNP Media Group has agreed to sell our historic newspaper buildings to Zamias Real Estate Company. My friend, Michael Zamias, and his colleague, Dave Martins, have assured us that they will renovate our venerable building with the same care and attention uh, to detail that they exhibited when they brought the Keppel Building to life just four blocks from here. Our production building, which is actually the collection of buildings bound by Vine, Queen, Mifflin, and Beaver Streets, presents a special challenge. It is at the gateway 
to southeast Lancaster and across the street from historic Southern Market, the county's convention center, and the Stephen Smith Historic Site. It too demands special attention. Lancaster County is fortunate to have another developer who is capable of reimagining that parcel as an active and integral part of city life. Just south of the city, they have built what is nationally recognized as best-in-class facilities. Willow Valley Communities, led by Marlon Thomas and John Swanson, has agreed to purchase the facility and develop a landmark urban campus to complement their campuses in West Lampeter Township. <laughs> As a result of these transactions, LNP and Steinman Communications will be relo relocating. Part of our operation will be located in East Lampeter. Our newsroom, our client solutions operation, and our video studio will be returning to the same street on which the Lancaster New Era newspaper operated in the early part of the last century. LNP Media Group and Steinman Communications will be relocating to North Queen Street into new facilities at 101 North Queen. The facility will help us attract and retain best-in-class workforce while maintaining our presence in the heart of downtown Lancaster. We will continue to serve the greater Lancaster County community from the center of our county. But the existential question remains, will LNP survive in this challenging time? The Steinman family has taken steps to enhance that likelihood by reinvesting all future profits, but that alone will not ensure the survival of our community newspaper. We also need your help. In Earl's words, we need your help to establish a robust connection between those who create journalism and the funding of those who create journalism. Here are five things you can do. One, please let our newsroom know about matters that merit attention. Our newsroom telephone number is in the newspaper every day and available on Lancaster Online. We have a dedicated email address and a website for tips, and we even offer an identity-protected tip site. You can also drop information off at our offices. Two, write letters to the editor or an op-ed for our opinions section. Share your views with others in our community. Three, use us to share your celebrations and to mourn with you. Allow others to participate in your joys and share your sorrows. Four, promote your products and services with us. We provide the most effective and innovative ways to reach consumers in Lancaster County. And five, please subscribe. We are your friends and neighbors serving as the watchdog to provide you with the most comprehensive news and information about Lancaster County. We've been doing it for about 225 years. We are one in a billion. Thank you all for coming and please join the Steinman family in the press room to celebrate.